So ladies and gentlemen, suppose I'm standing here on a beach. The stage is my beach. And you, the audience, you are the sea. <coughs> oh dear. <laughs> I believe somebody's drowning over there. <laughs> so now I have to do my Baywatch act. <laughs> and I will run first over the beach and then go swimming in the water. And now I notice, oh, the swimming is much slower than when I'm running over the beach. So my strategy of going in a straight line to the victim was not the best strategy I could take. In fact, the better strategy was if I'm moving fast over the beach to walk closer to the victim and then make a shorter distance with the slower swimming. So in fact, the shortest path here is not the fastest path. Now, this makes me think of when I shine light on an aquarium, and if we can dim the light a little bit, then you should be able to see a ray of light going through the aquarium. Um, then the light is not following a straight path, but first through the air, it's following a path, and then it refracts, and it follows a different path in the water. And that is because when going from a straight line, from point A in the air to B, somewhere in the water, it is faster to go a longer stretch through the air and a shorter stretch through the water. Hey, but that makes me think of what I did on the beach. It must be true that the light particles are moving faster through the air than through the water. But if the light particles are moving faster through the air than through the water, their energy of movement must be larger in the air than in water. But when I shine my light, I see green light going in, green light going out, which means that the light particles do not lose any energy. So where is the energy going if the light slows down in the water? Well, <laughs> Einstein had a solution to that. The energy is actually going into the mass of the particles. The particles acquire mass. So, the weight of wet light is more than the weight of dry light. Okay? Now, thinking out of the box, completely thinking out of the box now, as some colleagues, Peter Higgs, Robert Braut, Francois Englert, did about 50 years ago, you can assume that particles in general have a natural state in which they do not have any mass. So the natural state is everybody of you is massless, okay? Weight problems are over. <laughs> well, you have other problems if you're massless. Um, but now let's assume that the, the, the space is filled with a field and you interact with this field like the light interacts with the water and that is the way you acquire mass. Now this is a crazy thought. This is a crazy thought, but this was the prediction of these people. That there's a field, the Higgs field, that makes that all particles acquire a mass. So how do you test such an hypothesis? Well, how do you test that there is water in the, in the, in the basin here? If you make waves, then you actually see the water plant moving. You don't see much of the water moving, unless you see the surface, but you see the water plant moving. So this is the way you make the medium visible. So now, waves in a medium, according to Bohr, they are particles. So if I can make a wave in a medium, I should see it as particles. So how do you see them as particles? you have to hit this Higgs field very hard. And the way we do this at CERN in Geneva at the LHC is by accelerating protons and accelerating more protons and having them move against each other and then collide head-on in the detector, thereby producing so much energy in a very small spot that every now and then 
you make this wave in the Higgs field. I mean, in fact, making the Higgs particle. And this is one of these Higgs particles as it manifests itself in the detector. And you see the two yellow striking features. They are light particles. They're particles of light. And these particles of light is exactly what signals us, the physicists, that we made a wave in the Higgs field. We made a Higgs particle which decayed into these two photons. So for us, the two yellow features in the picture are the same as it would be to you to detect waves in water when you see the water plants moving. So this is an extremely simplified picture, of course, that I'm presenting to you. Um, and meanwhile, we studied this Higgs particle, we acquired a lot of them, and we found that it has exactly the properties that you would expect from a particle that inherits the properties from this vacuum field, from this field, this Higgs field that gives everything mass. So this is a triumph of physics. We found a particle that was theoretically predicted just with the properties as it was predicted 50 years ago. So then people ask me, so you found the Higgs particle. So what, what's next? What does it help us? And normally the, the question is political. It means, can we make money out of it? <laughs> and the answer is no, I have no clue. Absolutely not. But in doing these experiments, we have developed high-tech detectors and we have developed an understanding of the interaction of radiation with matter that is really very precise. In fact, we need these things to survive. Now, switching topic, you can actually put these things to good use to really, literally save lives. So the oldest example is probably a, a Röntgen picture, uh, an X-ray picture. And a more modern example is a, a PET scanner. Um, but I will walk you to two examples um, which are sort of now on the brink of uh, emerging. The first thing is that if you use well-prepared with accelerators protons or heavy nuclei, then these particles can lose a little bit of energy when they traverse matter up to a certain, certain target area that you can actually select the depth of and then lose suddenly all their energy. And after that, they're gone. So in contrast to X-rays, they will not make radiation damage before the target and after the target, but mostly where the target is. Now, it must be admitted that this takes a large gantry to realize, but this may have an interesting potential. My second example of what comes out of my particle physics colleagues is doing X-rays but not doing X-rays with black and white, but using micro-pixel detectors, not only to detect how much light shines through a body and making a black and white image, but do this as a function of the wavelength. Now, wavelength is just what you use to see in color. So this is just using wavelength-dependent transmission through bodies to make a color picture of the inside of the body. Okay, which of course uh, should give uh, interesting uh, diagnostic uh, insight. So, these last two examples are not incremental improvements on existing technology. They are really new technologies. So, they're actually a leap in technology. And the question to you now, you medical doctors that are around in the audience, is who dares to jump? Help! Oh, I forgot all about my victim. So now I should go to her following the Higgs mechanism, not through the shortest path, but through the fastest path. 